let's just jump right in, if I can. What's the function of a hook? Um, we have all sorts of hooks in our story. The type of story that we write is one hook. So if you write a mystery, who done it, that is answered at the end of the story. If you write a romance, will they get together? That's answered at the end of the story. But what we're looking at specifically in this course is to look at the kind of hooks that raise questions throughout your story and elicit responses from a reader to compel them to read a little bit further. And that's where you don't just use a hook in the beginning, you use hooks throughout the story. Um, the first hook we're going to look at is called the action danger hook. The key word here is the word danger. Think James Bond type of action um, with strong verbs, type of movement that if you were to see it out of the corner of your eye, it's going to snag your attention. So a person walking, not so much. That's movement, but it's not the sense that there might be danger there. A person, person running at full speed, yes, that's stronger action. A person running with a lion chasing them, absolutely. Now you've got both the danger sense and the action sense. So danger can be to the character. It can be inherent in the situation. Or it can be implied. So a person defusing a bomb or rappelling down a mountain are both in potentially dangerous situations. A car driving down the road, not necessarily. Unless there's a 16 year old male at the wheel with a driver's license in their pocket that so knew the plastic hasn't set and then absolutely comes in the danger fat. Let's look at a rough draft. We were sitting at the outdoor cafe, just minding our own business. It was a warm June day with clear robin blue skies. Any sense of danger here or action? So this is a rough draft. What I've taken is I've taken um, from a lot of different authors an example, and then I rewrote it into a rough draft because that's where we are often at with our work. We have something down and we think it's working, but we really don't know. So that's the rough draft. And this is how DJ McHale wrote this. The missile hit without warning. Totally different feel to it. You get a very strong sense of danger and it changes up. So when a reader reads something like this sentence at the opening of a story, and they know that it's a suspense story or a thriller based on where they pulled it out in a bookstore or the description of it, would this give you a reason to keep reading? Because it's raising, it's raising multiple questions, but definitely the danger question. An initial action danger hook, meaning anywhere that you're using this hook, it can be clarified almost immediately or prolonged deeper into the scene, into the chapter, or into the story. You don't have to answer it right away. But this is where we've always been told, don't answer a question without raising a new one. But until someone tells us exactly how you do that. As a writer, you can be, well, what do you mean? I haven't, I thought that I raised the question by the type of book it is, and that's not what this is. So here is another action danger. The same nightmare wakes me up versus I dream of blood spreading and pooling and soaking me. Now, this was in Ruth Ware's um, debut novel, and it gives a totally, there isn't that sense that 
they're running or climbing or doing something physical, but it's that sense of, of danger that is there. Okay. If you are writing something that you don't want as much tension with, you can bury that action danger hook in the middle of a longer sentence with less intense word choices, and it's an effective way to tone down the tension. Because not all our novels or books need to be highly tense. Okay, let's look at the overpowering emotion. And if you haven't yet taken the time to download that one page sheet, um, I would recommend you do it because that way you have all of these hooks, not in the necessarily the same order, but you have them and we'll be using them when we go to analyze your own hooks. So overpowering emotion. The key here is the word overpowering. It is not simply emotion. We should have emotion on every page in our stories. But overpowering emotion ramps it up for the reader. So a cry is emotion. A scream is stronger emotion. A man with a shaking hand holding a gun on the stranger is much more powerful emotion. It is implied in the situation. With the overpowering emotion hook, you need to keep in mind that not all readers will feel emotion in the same way. Um, one of my workshops, I gave an example from a romance novel and it was the opening line and it was very short and brief, but it was basically killed the baby. That has overpowering emotion because it means that a child is at risk. I had somebody though say, I don't see it. I don't get that. So that's why it's important to, as you're using hooks, particularly in the opening pages of your novel, to be aware that you don't want to, if you're sending it off to a traditional publisher or an agent, you want to give more than one hook. You want to give them enough that they are engaged, whether they relate to a specific hook or not. So this is not overpowering emotion. This is. And that's what we're aim aiming for here. And your challenge, all of us as writers, is to discover the types of hooks that work most effectively for what you are writing and who your readers are. That's why I asked for those who were willing to have their hooks analyzed to give me the genre or the subgenre that they were writing in, because that matters. You are not going to write the same kind of hooks or the number of hooks for a suspense that you are for a middle grade school or for a sweet romance. They're going to be different. Here we go with a rough draft. I remember it was my birthday when my mother passed away. This is simply a statement of fact. It doesn't have a whole lot of emotion unless it's been recently that your mother has um, passed away, then it might trigger. But this is how Ivan Doig wrote it in This House of Sky. Soon before daybreak on my sixth birthday, my mother's breathing wheezed more raggedly than ever, then quieted, then stopped. Now we have this context. It's not just an, an I as in a neutral person. We know this is a child. And you can hear that sound. And coming from his perspective, it was the then stopped that really pulls it together there. 
Here's another example. The first draft, the man had died. The second draft, he was dying. Versus, the teenage boy was dying alone. Do you see how the context ramps up the emotion for that particular hook? And this is not to say you always have to have somebody dying, you know, right off the bat in your opening hooks. These are just examples from a number of different genres. So it was two words that changed everything in this particular example. Keep in mind the context of your hook because you use it more than just on the first page. The first page, they know nothing about your story. And that's why sometimes an additional word or two, something that helps make it clearer for the reader is very important. But you're going to be using these hooks throughout your, your story, and I'll explain exactly where they're needed. And the re reason is, is the reader needs enough info and the nuances to make your hooks work and make the reader react the way you want them to in your story. And that's why Frederick Forsythe, in our last example, he used two words to paint enough of a picture for the reader. The next hook is called A Surprising Situation. Ask yourself, is this situation a surprise to the character? Is it a surprise to the reader? Either one, and you get the hook. Here's a rough draft. 75-year-old Frank Abbott, who worked as a seasonal Santa Claus, was found dead of a heart attack in his apartment. Now, given the age of the character, and it doesn't really seem to matter what his occupation was, but there's no sense of surprise. So let's look how J.D. Robb wrote this. Death was not taking a holiday. Now that's a short sentence, and when they're that short, oftentimes the reader will continue reading the next sentence. Death was not taking a holiday. New York may have been decked out in its glitter and glamour, madly festooned in December of 2059, but Santa Claus was dead. So that, you pick that book up the first time, this is the first sentence, it's like, whoa, did not expect to be reading about dead Santa. With a surprising situation hook, it's the contrast between what a reader expects and what is revealed. And that can be a powerful approach. And it can be this one you can use in any genre. Here's another rough draft. When my sister sent me a wedding announcement without the groom's name written on it, should have clued me in to the potential of disaster. Now this is a telling statement. It's not the sense that there's a surprise here. But this comes from Kristen Higgins. I jerked back in my chair, my Pinot Noir sloshing dangerously. Lowry, I choked out. I know, isn't it amazing? I'm marrying your ex-husband's brother. It just makes you cringe at the thought of family reunions. So it was a surprising situation to the point of view character who started this. And that's why it earns the surprising situation hook. A surprising situation hook intrigues a reader just a hint more, or sometimes a lot more, than a simple questions raised hook. So even something like the nun on the go-kart. Seeing that image, you don't expect. Now, 
given the nuns that I went to school with, I would imagine it would be less surprising if they were in a tank because that's the way it felt like at times. But go-karts, not so much. Now is the evocative hook. And I'll tell you straight up, I hate this hook. <laughs> I really hate it. And the reason is, is it can be so challenging to understand it. This hook can and does confuse and frustrate many writers. It's one of the hardest hooks to write and to identify. If this hook comes naturally in your voice and in your storytelling, you'll find yourself struggling with some of the other hooks that resonate easily with other writers. It could be literary word painting or beautiful scene. Those can be evocative, but it does not always pull the reader into the story the way you need with this hook. So it's more than just word painting or using a lot of description in a setting. Word painting can be intangible, but you know it when you read it. Think no one else could write it this way, or this really makes me pay attention, which is why it's one of the most subjective of the hooks. A lot of readers will not get this because they're just not in tune to that type of hook. The evocative hook must have that wow factor, and that can be very different for different readers. Here's a rough draft. Traveling after Christmas along the dark motorways around London reflected her mood, endless, pointless, and black. This is not evocative. The way that Hilary Montel writes, traveling, the dank, oily days after Christmas, the motorway, its wastes looping London, the margin scrub grass flaring orange in the lights, and the leaves of the poisoned shrubs striped yellow-green like cantaloupe melon. If you read this and you think, uh-uh, not my kind of story, that's perfectly all right, but it is still an evocative hook. It still says, wow, I would never think of writing it this way. If you're able to write about the usual in a way that makes the reader stop to think, he gods, I never thought of this kind of situation in this way, you might be close to the evocative hook. Here's an example, first draft. There had been problems in our marriage for a while, but I was willing to go to a marriage counselor if I could get my husband to come with me. Second draft. I was still willing to fight for our marriage. We had a comfortable life, a son not yet in his teens, and a lot of reasons to stay together if we'd work a little harder. Now, we've all read something like this, but this is how Elizabeth Berg opens her story. You know before you know, of course, you are bending over the dryer, pulling out the still warm sheets, and the knowledge walks up your backbone. And this says, either I got to find out what's going to go what's going on here, even though you know that it's something. The other two made it very, we were aware it was, it was about a disintegrating relationship. This one though, pulls you in and says, you have to pay attention the way that this author is going to unfurl her story. Keep in mind that using the evocative hook, particularly as an opening, it must be followed up throughout the novel. You can't just write and rewrite and rewrite to make that first sentence or that first paragraph be evocative 
because you're promising the reader a certain kind of story. You're saying, I know you're tired, it's late at night, you probably want to go to bed, but if you want to read this story, you have to read it the way that it is presented. The evocative hook promises the reader a very specific type of story told in a very specific way. And it doesn't matter whether it's a psychological thriller or it's a woman's fiction. It's not about the topic of the story. It's about the way the story is being told. And here's another example. Through the shredded black clouds, a fire moved like a dying star, falling back to earth, the earth, that is, of the disc world. But unlike any star had ever done before, it sometimes managed to steer its fall, sometimes rising, sometimes twisting, but inevitably heading down. And again, if you are reading this with, from Terry Pratchett, um, and you're going, uh-uh, uh-uh, don't, not my thing. You're probably one of those people that the evocative hook is not going to necessarily engage and intrigue them. The next hook is called a unique character. Um, and the lady who's taking photos of each of the things, you, there's a list with them all listed here. So there's no need to, to take the photo of it if it helps you. This character must be someone the average reader does not know or expect to see in that particular place or situation. A waitress in the character role of a waitress is not unique character, but a waitress in a WWE or the world wrestling entertainment match could be unique. A mother may not be unique. Don't tell my mom that, but a mother who's undergoing a sex change operation is probably unique. In another 20 years, maybe not. But right now, you don't expect that. So here is a rough draft. Luther Little had been a friend of mine for at least a dozen years. That's simply a statement of fact. Versus Luther Little drove dead bodies around Seattle the way some people drove pizzas. His primary mission, at least in his own mind, to make delivery before the goods got cold. Okay. This is, we all have had possible, we know about people who, funeral homes who pick up the bodies and bring them to whether they, wherever they need to be. But this is instead of going through a how tall they were, what color hair they were, any distinguishing, you know, scars, or this gives us a sense of the personality of Luther Little. And that's what creates a more unique character. When you're using the unique character hook, your point of view character. Are the character being introduced, even if they're not the protagonist, must be someone the average reader would not know or meet in a typical day or expect to see in that particular place or context. Here's an example. This is the rough draft. I caught up with Abraham Trahern in Sonoma. Okay, we have a name. And we have a location. And for the longest time, I thought it was in Sonoma, Arizona, but it wasn't. It was Sonoma, California, I think. Versus when I finally caught up with Abraham Trahern, he was drinking beer with an alcoholic bulldog named Fireball Roberts 
in a ram shackled joint just outside of Sonoma, California, drinking the heart right out of a fine spring afternoon. Now, setting aside, if you love dogs and this is just wrong, it still creates a unique character. And then after you're done with the book, you can call the whatever to report Abraham Trahern for the way that he treats his dog. There's another, this is coming out of a romance. As a detective, you think I get used to dangerous situations. This one isn't a romance. Versus, you think that anyone who'd been shot three times and almost became an organ donor would try to avoid dangerous situations in the future. So here we have, we've got just enough information about the character that gives us an idea that it is not someone we, we might be a detective, we might know detectives, but it is the other information that sets this character as unique. Now, the unique character hook doesn't mean that the point of view character in the opening line remains unique throughout the story. So Abraham Trahern with his alcoholic bulldog, once we know that about him, you don't get to use it as a, another hook opening the second chapter or a hook deeper into the story because we identify that character already. They are no longer unique. What it means is that for the space of that one sentence, this hook pulls the reader into the story before another hook or series of hooks are going to carry the reader deeper into the novel. Foreshadowing with or without warning. Ask yourself, does the sentence in question hint that whatever is happening is going to play out in more depth in the story? Even if it doesn't, it isn't the main through line on the story, just that sense of this is going to matter later on. A warning ratchets that foreshadowing up just a little bit more. Watch where you're going can be foreshadowing because we know something possible could happen. We don't know what it is at all, but we have that sense. Watch out where you're going or the boogeyman will get you is both foreshadowing and warning. It's also one of the few Indonesian words in the English language because the boogeyman was based on the pirates in the East Asian, Southeast Asian seas. Here's a rough draft. She couldn't remember how many years it had been since she left home, but she was back at last. We've all read about somebody coming back to where they were. This is a statement of fact. Versus, the wild child of Parish, Mississippi had come back to the town she left behind forever. You almost get the cadence of the, the Mississippi drawl when you read this particular, and it gives more information and a stronger sense. So it is that sense of foreshadowing with a hint of warning in there. A foreshadowing hook without the warning element included can still be foreshadowing, but it tends to not be a strong hook as when used in a foreshadowing with warning combination. But if you're writing something like middle grade, um, again, something not tense, a children's book, just a foreshadowing her hook can be powerful. It doesn't have to have that warning. Here's a rough draft. He opened the door to his office while juggling a full briefcase and a cooling cup of coffee. Okay, no sense of foreshadowing. We know probably he's going to work. Versus, it should have been the greatest day of his life. So we have a hint that 
something was about to unfold and unfold in a way that he was not expecting. All hooks create questions in a reader's mind. But the foreshadowing with or without the warning creates a specific type of question. Because it's a question about what's going to happen next. How does this impact the story? Here's a first draft. This, the Israeli intelligence agencies were the ones who came up with a list of 12 indicators that law enforcement personnel and those trained to look specifically for the signals have come to depend on to predict the erratic but telltale behaviors often manifested by potential suicide bumps. That's a mouthful and it's all telling versus Lee Childs, suicide bombers are easy to spot. With this as an opening line, you have a sense because it's a bomber that there's, it's a foreshadowing with warning that it has something to do that the point of view character saw something that's going to play out. The next hook, surprising or shocking dialogue. Now, this can be internal or it can be external dialogue. So someone's thought can work here or an external. Ask yourself if you expected the character to say that or think that. Or did the character expect to hear that? Given the context, is this dialogue expected? Go back to the one hook that we had with Trey Hearn and the alcoholic bulldog. This gets the surprising or shocking dialogue hook in addition to the unique character hook because you don't expect that situation. If you have a surprising situation or the unexpected, which is another hook, you usually can have a shocking or witty dialogue. F bombshell, the nun said, is shocking. F bombshell, the hell's but angel biker dude said, is not. So if you're sitting in the middle of a, a card game with Hell's Bikers and someone said this, it's not going to be shocking or surprising. But those nuns again sitting around the table, it is. Here's a rough draft. Kathy really didn't like birthdays. Doesn't really send that sense of this is surprising versus birthdays are like a box of Tampax. You did not expect that sentence to pull you into a story. So always think in terms of the context of the words and think would the average reader expect to hear this type of dialogue coming from this type of character in this specific situation? The next example, rough draft, is coming from a young adult novel. Tally Youngblood can hardly wait until her 16th birthday when she can become a pretty. Now, at this point, you don't know what a pretty is. So there might be a sense of foreshadowing here, but it's not surprising or shocking dialogue. Versus, the early summer sky was the color of cat vomit. Now you have a sense of a young adult character. Totally unexpected hook. If you have a surprising situation hook, you often also have that totally unexpected hook, but not always. Ask yourself, do you as a reader expect this to happen or have happened to this 
degree. So that's, it's a nuance in here. Does the character expect this to happen or have happened? Here's an example. Rough draft. The 9-11 call was pretty straightforward. There was an unexpected object in the homeowner's yard. Okay, that happens. Versus, the flying saucer landed on our front yard and a little green man got out of it. Okay, did not expect that to happen. Think of the totally unexpected hook as taking that surprising situation to the next level. Now that last example, the little green men, that's gonna be both totally unexpected and a surprising situation because it was surprising to the point of view character. It's that juxtaposition between what the reader expects and what the author delivers that helps to create that totally unexpected hook. This is coming from a mystery series. I love it because there's um, an Anglican priest or Episcopalian and a sheriff of a small town. Um, she was thankful to be offered a ride home from the town's chief of police when her car wouldn't stop. This might be foreshadowing, but it does to not totally unexpected. Versus... It was one hell of a night to throw away a baby. Okay, you have more than the totally unexpected, but that's the one I want you to focus on here. Think of that totally unexpected hook as ratcheting up a surprising situation to that next level. Your grandmother dancing with your father at a wedding is not uncommon. So no hook. We have no other context. We just grandma and your father. Your estranged grandmother, though, dancing with her son-in-law, your father, whom she hasn't spoken to in 20 years, might be a surprising situation. It's going to be a, a sense of foreshadowing. But your grandmother heading to her job as an exotic dancer after the wedding is totally unexpected unless you have one of those really cool grandmas. This next hook is the questions raised. This is the easiest hook of all for most people to create and to identify. However, it doesn't matter how many questions are raised. You only get to earn one point for this particular hook. So the last example of grandma going to her night job, I guess, um, that raises a question, but that's only one hook. It gets foreshadowing hook, that's two. It gets surprising situation, that's three. Totally unexpected, that's four. Unique character, that's five. But I want you to know this is qu any question that's raised and all the other hooks raise questions, you only get one point. If you as the reader ask how, what, where, why, or what happens next, you have this hook. The questions raised hook is about both direct questions, such as Bob said, did he do it? Or indirect questions, such as, the sun rose 13 minutes earlier than it should have done. Both of those create questions. Both of those get the one question hook. Wednesday dawn just like Tuesday. That's a, nothing happening here, no hooks, versus, a perfect night for, and I'm going to get this mispronounced, Fyodor. It's some kind of a South American specialty. Is how, from the point of view of the 
we find out in a minute that it's going to be the victim as they, they're driving someplace. So there's a question raised. There's not a lot of other hooks in this particular one. If any question is raised as a result of your sentence, you earn one hook point and only one point for the questions raised hook. Rough draft. He saw a man's life change. Okay, that's the question raised hook. And once you start playing with hooks, it's really hard not to write a hook or an opening sentence without a hook because you know you can get at least this one. Jack Reacher ordered espresso, double, no peel, no cube, foam cup, no china. Before it arrived at his table, he saw a man's life change forever. Now this has other hooks with it, foreshadowing, surprising situation, um, but it does have the questions raised. What happened here? Now, this next hook, again, along with the um, evocative hook, is one of the most subjective. If you read and write in only one genre, for example, mystery or romance, fantasy or Western, children, young adult, or subgenre, a police procedural mystery, an inspirational romance, the high or epic fantasy, steampunk Westerns, you're probably used to seeing certain types of hooks that resonate with those specific readers. If you're writing a mystery with a strong romantic element or a fantasy Western with steampunk overlap, you'll need to be writing for readers who read multiple genres. So you're not just writing for the Western reader. You're not just writing for the romance reader. You are writing for both readers and where they intersect. And while all hooks are subjective, all of us as readers and writers will respond in different degrees to all hooks. It's a foolish writer who assumes that since they are not writing light or comedic story, that they'll never need to use the humor hook. Rough draft. This is, I believe it is a young adult. Yep. I was having a very bad day at school. This is a foreshadowing hook. Um, it raises a question. But other than that, there's no sense of humor. Anyone who has had a teenager or young adult or middle school, I have heard this sentence versus the undead are ruining my life. I blame my mother. Okay, again, because the first line is relatively short, it's easy to go to the second line. And it's that second line that because it is so common to hear, it's mom's fault that I'm the way I am. The undead are ruining my life. You don't expect. I blame my mother. So it's that the cross between those two that make this a humor hook. The humor hook is present because the line's clearly funny. It's because of what happened leading up to that line, or sometimes because of the character or characters involved or the context. We'll go back to our old friend, the child. Rough draft. You think we can handle this, he asked. We're good to go, Reacher said. Ho oh, hum, no sense of humor. Between them, they had two Glocks and 68 rounds, plus their recent purchases in the Prelude's trunk. Two against seven or more. No time, no element of surprise, a fortified position with no way in, a hopeless situation. We're good to go, Reacher said. So it's that sense of kind of an ironic humor there that works is build up to they're going into a hopeless situation with a lot of armaments and the comment that he makes at the end. So he builds to that point. 
humor revealed through internal or external dialogue can quickly create this empathetic bond with the reader. Doesn't mean we have to like the point of view character, but humor, even a hint of it, allows the reader to relate to a character. Bottom line, that the writer who is able to understand the power and the versatility of all 10 hooks is the writer who can engage more readers. Thank you, Lucy. I'll pay you a, <laughs> a benefit. So let's quickly go through hook placement before we go to the hooks that you sent along. Now, while we're doing this, I want you to find your list of hooks that is in, Lucy, do you want to pop in and tell them exactly where to find it? I think most of them have found it now. It's the very bottom of the event. If you keep on going more, 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 it's the bottom of it. Good. Opening sentence of a book. And that's what we're going to look at when we're looking at the examples that folks sent in. That's a key location. But also the end of the opening paragraph. Do you remember the example from J.D. Robb, who started with, it seemed like, when she got down to the last lines there was, and Santa was dead. End of the first page. Now you're looking at on average 250 words per page, go back anywhere between like 175 to 200 and 30. You can add a hook in there. Why? Because if you go to a brick and mortar store where you can have a cappuccino, which is always a bonus, but you can watch readers pick up a book and they do it in a specific step. They pick up the book or and look at the cover first. That's why when books are faced out so people can see the cover, they can immediately understand what kind of store is it dark and somber? Is it two kissing people? You get a lot of information from the cover. Then they'll flip the book over to look at a little bit of the blurb on the book. What kind of story is this? Only at that point do they open the book. And if they read the first sentence or two, the first paragraph, that's where most people make their decision about buying that book. Some diehards who've been burned in the past have to get to the end of that first page. That's why we put another hook there because they've got to keep finding out what's going on. End of the third page. And this matters if you are in particular are submitting to traditional publishers because traditional publishers, they tell us they read the first 50 page or first 100 pages. The truth is they don't have time for that. But if they get to the end of the third page, that's when they oftentimes make up their mind or they're going to give that manuscript to a reader that they have employed who knows with that particular publisher what type of story that they're looking for. They'll read it and report back and say, oh, yeah, this is our kind of story, or report back and said, uh-uh. But that end of the third page hook can help make that decision, which gets you a little bit further. End of the third chapter. And again, end of the third chapter tends to be one of those places that most readers will put the book down by that time because they're going to sleep. But if you give them a reason to keep reading there, just one more page, just one more chapter. That means you have hooked them into the story. So if you've read a book that has kept you up longer than you wanted to be up reading it, study it because that author knows how to use hooks. Now you're also going to use hooks at the opening of all chapters. Why? Because it's a natural place for the reader to put the book down is at the end of the chapter. 
But if they read the next line and it engages them again and keeps them going, they'll keep reading. And the ending of the chapter. So end of chapter two, beginning of chapter three, all the way throughout the story. Every scene opening and ending. And when you're writing a series, looking close to the last sentences, because you want to engage them in the next book in the series, or to go find out what's if it's continuing, the individuals involved are coming back in the next book. Just a hint. And that's why oftentimes um, you will find the next, an excerpt from the next book included in a work to engage you and hook you into that particular book.